Many people listening us anyway, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be all right. Is that? Okay. Yeah, we are. Çok değerli misafirler. Distinguished guests and fellow participants and beloved speakers. Before proceeding my speech, I would like to salute you with deep respects, and I hope that this session is going to be fruitful for all of us. Welcome. In the afternoon of the second day, it's Denmark special session. We will be talking about the procurement chain and the market development and wind economics. In this session, we have very valuable speakers. I will introduce them in a minute. Mustafa Bey made a very good surprise in the Turkish introduction CDs about the market uh, week. I think he wanted to make a connection between the week and the in and this session thank you very much for this nice surprise distinguished participants within energy world wind power has opened a new era and before proceeding with our speakers i would like to touch upon a couple of points especially in the last decade in turkey the economic development and in parallel with this economic development electricity energy and the increase in the other energy demands uh, are big facts that should be considered in the previous period the thanks to the competitive policies, energy policies have gained new horizons in this regard. Of course, developing economy and the increasing population result in that the liberalization of the energy market in Turkey and it has become electricity energy market brought new electricity energy investments. When we look at the last decade before that decade, the energy consumption and installed power was around 30,000 megawatt. Now it is around 68,500 megawatt, and our consumption, which used to be 145 billion kilowatt, now it is around 245 billion kilowatts. Therefore, it doubled. The figure has doubled, especially in the renewable and wind energy. We didn't have anything in the past. Now we have an installed capacity of 3,500 megawatt wind energy power plants. In this fast growth conjuncture, when we look at the targets of 2023. In 2023, the energy that we are planning to consume is around, is going to be around 450 billion kilowatt per hour. And among this amount, 90 
100,000 megawatt installed power is expected to be reached. This is going to be a requirement. And the wind power capacity in the framework of the government policies, I mean renewable energy capacity, is expected to reach among the total installed power uh, is going to be 30 percent. This is the main target. In our country, as of September, we have 3,485 megawatt installed capacity, wind power capacity. When we reach 2023, we're expecting it to reach 20,000 megawatts. And this is our desire to attain. The total installed capacity potential in terms of wind power is around 40,000, 50,000 gigawatt. And there is a long way to go when considering this fact. And we have a huge market potential growth. Therefore, the liberalization of the market and its opening to competition and the right policies applied, the renewable energy. And within the renewable energy, the wind power and the wind issue will take its position, its desired position. We hope that it will take its position. I hope that this session is going to be a nice and fruitful session. Now I would like to continue with our speakers. Our first speaker is Mr. Jasper Packard Pedersen. He's from Denmark Energy Agency. Welcome. Mr. Pedersen, he is the head of section in the Dan Denmark Energy Agency, and he has experience. He has special experience in the international energy and climate, and increasing the energy cooperation, the energy efficiency, and the development of renewable energy are the are his fields of expertise. He worked in Washington D.C. and Copenhagen, Rasmussen and United States Congress. He had positions as a consultant. The floor is yours, Mr. Patterson. Th thank you. All right. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and um, for the invitation to speak here today. I am from the uh, Danish Energy Agency. Um, some of you have probably heard our uh, minister, uh, Mr. Rasmus Helve Petersen, who uh, was part of the opening ceremony yesterday. Um, I would like to talk, because I'm part of the, uh, from one of the Danish government agencies, about some of the policy underpinnings um, that uh, Denmark utilizes in order to try to support uh, wind energy value chains and uh, wind energy market development in general. So. To start somewhere, I think it's uh, very relevant to look at one of the main catalysts for uh, the Danish energy ev policy evolution as it is today, and that really begins in 1973, where there was a major oil crisis. And what you see here on the picture is um, a policy solution that the Danish government had to embrace, namely carless Sundays. Uh, the government simply had to forbid driving on Sundays because they experienced an oil shock that was so severe uh, there was 99% dependency on um, foreign oil and all of a sudden when the country I experienced the inability to actually obtain this oil, they had to take some very drastic measures. This is one of them. The car you see on the picture is actually a police car that makes sure that no other drivers are using their vehicles. So. This was, of course, not a long-term uh, sustainable situation, so policymakers uh, really had to think of uh, a lot of other policy measures going forward in order to make sure that this never happened again. And so 40 years later um, today, uh, Denmark actually has one of the best setups for energy security. Um, policymakers have uh, really found a number of ways to hedge against the situation you saw before with the high uh, degree of dependency. And uh, today, Denmark actually has one of the highest contents of non-hydro renewable energy. And this is a result of 
many, many years of uh, policy evolution that has um, been uh, supported over consecutive governments and long-term political agreements. And I'll get into some of the specifics of that in, uh, in a little bit. Um, but some of the main components are renewable energy and especially wind energy, um, but also a, a very high degree of energy efficiency. Um, so it has created a, a very resilient economy where Danish um, economy in general is um, much more resilient to price shocks. Uh, whether prices go uh, up or down very drastically, um, Denmark actually has the ability today to produce a lot of energy domestically, and that is clean energy and affordable energy. And it also is able to support um, some of the leading global sectors uh, in clean tech, green tech, especially the wind industry, which is, um, uh, of course, uh, some of the people that are here today um, and, and probably you know some of the major Danish uh, corporations and, and subcontractors uh, in this field. So if we look at some of the uh, policy drivers and how they've changed, the main focus in the 70s was really about security of supply and cheap energy following these price shocks. But uh, over the course of time, and especially once we passed the year 2000, um, the policy drivers have really evolved into a, a broader portfolio. Uh, for instance, Denmark has managed to decouple economic growth from growth in resource use. And this is somewhat unique in uh, the developed world because usually those two things follow each other very closely. Um, but also, Denmark has been able to do this in a, in a very uh, sustainable way um, and in a, a CO2 neutral or actually um, a, a, a CO2 reducing uh, manner. So one of the long-term goals is actually to have a fossil-free economy by the year 2050. I'll get into some of the specifics of that in, in just a little bit. But also still, security of supply is a major goal that uh, Danish policymakers have set for themselves. And then also um, cost efficiency. Denmark is able to produce um, electricity, especially at a very competitive rate. Of course, the end user rate is a little bit different because there are uh, tariffs and taxes um, involved, but the, the actual price that energy is produced at is, is very competitive com compared to uh, most of our neighbors. So here's part of the global context of, uh, of where Denmark fits in. If you look at it, this is a, um, a scenario from the uh, Energy Information Agency, which is part of the United States Department of Energy. And they estimate that between today and 2040, the global growth in energy demand will grow by about 40%. And pretty much all of that growth will come from non-OECD countries, specifically from China and India. So if we think that um, we see volatile energy markets today, we haven't seen anything yet because the demand is about to go uh, upwards very dramatically. But so let's see, how does Denmark fit into that picture? Well, as I mentioned before, um, Denmark has actually been able to decouple economic growth from growth in, in resource consumption. And it, you'll see the red line up here is um, growth in GDP, of course, some upwards and downwards trajectories, um, for example, through the 2008 recession. But it has been accompanied by um, a gross energy consumption that has been reduced. And the long-term uh, outlook is actually, uh, for, for all of the EU, is actually a flatlining demand. Uh, but for many economies, and this in includes Denmark, there will be a reduced demand. Um, and in the meantime, this has also been done with a 28% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So, Danes don't usually like to brag, but I think um, in this instance, this is actually something that uh, has uh, worked and worked quite well. So one of the key components that Danish policymakers really think about in terms of um, trying to create a positive foundation for wind energy value chains and uh, you know, have positive effect for uh, the wind energy market development in general is trying to set ambitious and long-term goals. And let me run through a couple of them. This is from the latest um, major energy agreement from 2012. Um, and as you'll see, in 2020, the goal is to have 50% renewable energy in our system. In 2030, the goal is to phase out coal. By 2035, all electricity and heat will be uh, produced from renewable energy. And by 2050, the goal is to have a fossil-free economy. Now, these 
goals sound very aspirational. But the interesting thing about them is that we're actually on course to meet these goals at this time. One of the other notions is to take a broader perspective on the notion of sustainability. Where we often think about sustainability in environmental terms, policymakers really try to think of a, a broader notion of it. So that includes uh, economic considerations, commercial considerations. You know, for example, is there an actual value chain in place? Um, is, are uh, various sectors of the Danish economy uh, positively and constructively influenced by these policy goals that uh, policymakers set. Um, beyond that, is there a knowledge base in the country? And this uh, includes um, you know, researchers, academics, consultants, um, but, but also a corporate knowledge base that's able to consistently um, ensure that technology evolves in order to push down the price curves and make sure that um, for example, our um, electricity grid is actually able to encompass a large degree of renewable energy, uh, which has um, you know, volatility and, um, and also increasingly uh, is produced um, in, a, uh, in a decentralized way. And ensuring that knowledge base is actually a major investment, but it's something that we think that, uh, has very long-term benefit. Um, so that's why uh, this is included in, in one of the sustainability considerations. If we look at some of the key elements in Danish energy policy, um, we can see over here to the right that they include uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and electrification. But, but all of this, as I mentioned uh, just previously, is really dependent on um, a substantive knowledge base from research development and demonstration. Um, it's really the basis for um, continuing to evolve the technology in a way that makes it available and, uh, and cost effective so it can compete with um, often subsidized fossil energy. Policymakers generally try to uh, send the right signal to market actors. So this, for example, includes uh, cost-effective and time-limited subsidies. So subsidies uh, have an end, uh, sorry, subsidies have a beginning, but it's also very important to describe when they end because the ultimate goal is to have non-subsidized energy production. And once subsidy schemes are phased out, it's very important that there is a, a, a self-sufficient market to actually carry on the crucial energy uh, production that, that then uh, is up and running. Um, also, energy, uh, quite ambitious energy taxes and fossil fuels is something that policymakers uh, use to uh, modify uh, consumer behavior. And then um, fairly generous support for uh, research and development. <clears throat> if we look at some of the other uh, crucial interests and the uh, I would point to some of the key elements of Danish energy policy agreements. So agreements, um, we, we have a lot of uh, political parties in the Danish uh, parliament and there's often a joke that's used in Denmark that um, governments may come and go but the policy stays the same. It's not always accurate on all sorts of policy sectors but when it comes to uh, support for uh, energy sectors sectors and the energy uh, policies that have evolved since the 1970s, it's actually been a very consistent um, and long-term uh, policy evolution over time. So first of all, parties try to reach consensus with as many parties as possible. The norm in Denmark is to have minority coalition governments, but they try to really expand the political agreements and the last uh, agreement that was made was supported by all parties except one, a very small one. Um, so this is something that really lends um, predictability to energy markets and it's something that the, the market actors can use uh, to uh, do their long-term investment and long-term planning. Um, it's also very important um, to have uh, an ambitious dialogue with stakeholders um, and to really incorporate their considerations uh, into this planning and, and policy making and, uh, and finally to create a, a a stable framework that's flexible enough to incorporate uh, different technological evolutions and also changes in uh, consumer behavior. 
So this is one of the uh, results. Renewable energy in Denmark has been on a steady uh, growth path. Um, here are a, a number of uh, renewable energy sectors, including uh, wind, biomass, um, and uh, waste, uh, waste to energy uh, schemes, and so on. But if we look specifically at wind power integration, um, you'll also see a, a steady increase uh, where market actors have uh, sought first um, really to evolve land-based windmills, um, and then uh, increasingly over later years, you'll see some, uh, some of the offshore projects really take off. Here's where the uh, private sector actors come in. You can see that actually a majority of uh, wind projects are owned by individuals. And also uh, in investors, investments often come from uh, the private sector. We also have cooperatives, um, and there are schemes where uh, the neighbors of windmills basically have the, uh, either the first bid or um, uh, basically a, a better setup for investing in, in windmills. And this is one way to ensure better uh, public acceptance and buy-in. So another result is a high degree of green energy technology exports. It's one of the very strong sectors in Denmark. And actually, uh, even during the European recession, uh, the clean tech and green tech industries uh, were able to grow, even though many other sectors in uh, the Danish economy and throughout the European economy were hurting. So here are some of the, here are some of the lessons uh, that are learned in terms of uh, supporting um, the wind energy value chains and uh, general market development uh, in, in direction of expanding renewables. Um, it's a very challenging effort. So in the beginning, the technology wasn't uh, truly in place, but also um, there have been uh, hits and misses when it comes to the actual policy evolution. So there's need for uh, frequent adjustments, and this is something we, we again seek to do um, in a con consensual way. Um, but it has turned out that the, this kind of energy transition is actually affordable. Um, Denmark is now able to produce wind energy at a high rate. Uh, so it, it's a large percentage of uh, electricity production. But the uh, rate that consumers pay is actually very competitive. It's also technologically feasible. And the outlook, uh, the scenarios tell us that um, when we are able to uh, produce even larger wind farms and uh, field uh, larger windmills, uh, prices will again keep going, keep being pushed down, so that um, provides for uh, some very interesting long-term prospects. Um, but it has also turned out to be a real catalyst for economic growth at the macro level. Um, and there are many new business opportunities from sectors that are able to export um, and install their, uh, their projects. Um, at a global scale, but also uh, provide servicing and analysis and consulting and so on. So in conclusion, um, some of the main lessons in terms of securing the wind energy value chain in Denmark and the market development through policy schemes um, is tied to the notion of expanding uh, the, the concept of sustainability across more than uh, the immediate environmental considerations, but it's also about creating stable long-term policy frameworks um, that have a consensus behind them so people can, so consumers and market actors can reasonably know what to expect. Um, and then uh, it really also takes a dedicated uh, private sector that is interested in uh, making investments in, uh, in uh, technological uh, evolution and uh, also be uh, expedient in terms of uh, seeking out interesting new growth markets such as, Tur su such as the Turkish one. So I'd like to thank you um, for, for listening to this. I would welcome uh, your questions afterwards. Um, I also welcome you to visit the, uh, the two websites listed here. Uh, the top one is uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Energy, Climate and Buildings. The uh, lower one is the, uh, the link to the Danish Energy Agency, which is actually part of the ministry. And finally, you're also welcome to send any uh, email questions that you might have. Thanks. I thank you very much for your contributions, Mr. Patterson. Now we have uh, Mr. Eric uh, Christiansen. Eric
Christiansen is a graduate of Ar Aarhus. Uni he was he, he was a former head of Industrial Corporation of Aarhus University. He was a lecturer, supervisor, and consultant in the 1990s. From uh, in in the 2000s, he served to the, to the Danish government uh, in terms of improving quality and talent uh, management. And then he moved to the uh, Aarhus University. And in 2012, he built his own sipping out company. And now he is the CEO of Brains. And that's how he continues uh, serving to the industry. Mystic, uh, Mr. Eric Christiansen, the floor is yours. Welcome to all of you who are still interested in wind energy this afternoon. And um, thank you for allowing me to have a little bit of your time sharing some ideas and insights into the wind industry. Uh, inter yeah, the wind industry. So um, first, thank you to uh, uh, Mr. Munib Karakilic for the introduction. Thank you very much. Then secondly, I would say um, I'm building my uh, presentation in two, um, two ideas. One thing is to look at the value chain as it is now, and secondly, to discuss maybe a radical change in the value chain to come in a very ne near future. So I'm going to make a little, um, little fuss about that we are actually going to see a very changed uh, industry regarding wind energy, but also in the renewable industry as such. First, let me present uh, my two approaches. One is the, what I call a classic uh, 1.0 approach. This is uh, actually how we could see the, the, the wind turbine generator industry today, the value chain, the market uh, trends. But let's also see into the future. And when we see into the, to the future, I have to say this is my own perception of the future, so you don't have to agree with me. You can actually discuss with me whether you find it interesting. So a more radical approach, what does that mean? The thing is that um, when we see uh, the industry today, um, it's a very different regionalized uh, wind energy uh, industry. We have three big regions, uh, the Americas, we have northern, part, partly northern Europe, and then we have Asia. And these are quite different markets, and they are actually behaving quite different. Uh, but the fundamental thing in these markets uh, is that cost has to go down on the, the cost of energy has to go down and you compare it to other sources, so you're talking about the levelized cost of energy really has to go down. So we see a trend towards a globalization of the industry. We see a trend towards uh, technology platforming and uh, standardization movement. We see a trend towards uh, cost cutting and we see a trend towards uh, actually optimizing the whole value chain, meaning that the value chain is also increasingly globalized for almost all players in the markets. They have to be uh, part of uh, the global, uh, being global, else they can't really do sales uh, internationally. We see a lot of uh, basic facts around that. So let me touch upon a few trends uh, before we can continue. So this one figure is actually about uh, the trends when it comes to conventional energy production compared to renewable energy production, we see a cost increase in uh, what we call um, the classic energy sources, and we see a cost decrease when we look into renewables, especially for the wind and uh, onshore and offshore. Uh, we see a, a very dramatically uh, price reduction in the cost of energy when it, when it comes to a production of one megawatt hour. So there is a trend towards a very competitive industry uh, when we look into the wind power. The second thing is the perspectives for different renewables. Uh, we have on the, the uh, bar above different uh, sorts of uh, growth opportunities for different sorts of renewables and the, and the bar below from 2008 is uh, the mix of uh, renewable energies. We can see hydro is basically stable. Biomass is uh, increasing, but wind is really taking the big market share. Um, and uh, this is uh, whether it's going to be 880 gigawatt or 1,000 gigawatt uh, within this time. I, it doesn't really matter. The thing is, the trend is clear. Um, also, when we see into the market uh, development, we see two uh, schemes here, 2010 and 2015. 
2010, we see that Asia has a very large uh, production of megawatt installed in 2010, but since they have predominantly small turbines, they're not accumulating that much when it comes to megawatt. In 2015, this picture is actually changing. We see Asia also gaining momentum in, in larger turbines, and, um, and that technology has uh, developed quite fast. We see Europe is uh, actually a market where we see uh, very, very large turbines and very huge machinery, and America is uh, some, somewhere in between. Um, when we look to the markets and the market trends, and this is uh, really important to see that these are actually not one big globalized market, it's actually region, regional uh, strategies. Europe uh, goes really towards uh, large uh, turbines. We talk about uh, six megawatt and eight megawatt machines, and we probably see uh, 10 megawatt machines uh, coming up soon. And when we talk about eight megawatt machines, we, we talk about one turbine, 250 meters of height. 250 meters, just think about it, one machine. So really, really large uh, machines. These are very complicated, but the, the reason for getting uh, larger and larger is that the swept area of the rotor, the, the area where the rotor actually gains the harvesting wind, is going to be increased very, very much. So making one machine much more efficient than a bunch of small ones. When we look into Asia, that's quite another uh, um, competition parameter, and that is re really the price. Price is uh, about everything, so if you don't um, fit the market uh, price-wise, you're not going to be there. When we talk about America, it's, a, it's a basically a political system. Uh, there's a very strong uh, energy sector in America producing other sources of energy, so there's a, a fight and a battle between actually how much to support wind energy. We see some uh, different um, funding schemes coming uh, forth and back and uh, making America a very volatile uh, market. We're going to see a lot of development in South America, in Brazil uh, predominantly, but um, let's see how it, how it ends up. Conclusion is that if we look at these market strategies, we, we're going to see some of the, the value chain and some of the, the, the producers, they're going to, to uh, actually be more global in competition, especially for generators and gearboxes. They are today very uh, global. Uh, when it comes to competition, you can basically get the things from uh, all, all over the, glo uh, the globe. Uh, and when it comes to blades, uh, blades are very difficult to, to design. Uh, it needs to, takes a lot of knowledge on load and uh, aerodynamics and the towers uh, are difficult to handle and, and shuffle around, so they are predominantly more regional uh, produced. So uh, we see a, a, actually an industry trend towards um, very different markets and, uh, and different perspectives, but basically price and capacity and industrialization and standardization, those are the drivers in, uh, in the market. When we look into uh, competition, uh, just to, to state it, we see that turbines are increasing in size, megawatt uh, on the y-axis and uh, a year on the x-axis. We can actually see that, that generally uh, the pressure on producing larger turbines and uh, better components and at the same time actually uh, try to minimize weight uh, and, and load on the system, uh, we see that trend is a, is a, a Proceeding, we see that turbines are getting bigger. Uh, when I look into Turkey, um, there's a very good material in the package. You can actually see what kind of turbine is in bid and is, is up, going to be installed in Turkey, and we can see a lot of 2.53 megawatt uh, turbines coming up. That's quite interesting. These are compared to, to Denmark, uh, rather big uh, machineries onshore. So, Another thing which is very important for the value chain to think about, that's actually um, the, the, the specialization. Um, if you are not specialized, the company uh, doing very many different things, you're not entirely focused on wind energy, then you tend actually to have a very low, uh, very, very low export sale. If you, on the other hand, are a company who really want to be in energy and you, so to speak, use 100% of your resources becoming better within that field, then you will have a lot, lot larger chance of being compatible uh, globally and have a larger um, export sale. You would, uh, and, and this is basically what this is about, you see. These companies here, they are, have a very less amount of uh, revenue generated from wind power, 
and basically they are very home market oriented and very local oriented. On the other hand, if you have a company which is uh, predominantly or 100% doing uh, wind energy, you'll see a high degree on uh, international sales exports and you'll see also this one. So basically this amount, which is the home market amount, this uh, share of home market uh, appearance is quite uh, small. So um, companies really specializing. They are, they are having a competitive edge. That's important to say when you think about the industry in Turkey, it has to be, or at least over time, become very specialized and focused in what it does, uh, as it won't have a chance when it comes to getting from Turkey and out into the international uh, competition. When we look a little more into the component, what does, what does that actually mean? Then we can see that, uh, as I said before, towers and blades are still uh, predominantly uh, regionalized but um, some of the main components are actually to be sourced from everywhere, and this uh, puts a pressure on the, on the price, price uh, mechanism. So, what does that mean? That means we have three different market parameters. One parameter is adaptation to local. That means being local, adapt to local conditions. In Turkey, I guess for many companies who would like to invest in Turkey, that is a very, very, very important uh, parameter. That is the parameter of getting into the market, so market access and maybe uh, to some extent also uh, a cost, um, cost rationale. On the, this axis here, which is uh, predominantly Europe, we see a scale economy benefits where we see larger volume productions, we, we see um, Oh, sorry, we see uh, actually trading with different knowledges across uh, the economies, meaning that um, you can actually uh, make cross-regional sales, you can actually understand what is uh, important in this market, and then you can actually sell the, the assets or the goods in different markets. So you see uh, lots of companies actually uh, seeing and looking for different potentials in different markets. That's what we call aggregation. And then the last thing as well also for the trading benefits arbitration, we see the, the price on uh, pr uh, produced energy and the price of the components being a, a relatively important uh, market driver. So actually we have three different uh, strategies. So adaptation and we have aggregation and we have ar arbitration. And these, uh, these drivers, when, when we look into what are they going to mean to, to us, in the industry, I think, uh, and these conclusions are really my own, so you can, you can actually debate them. But I think uh, you have to think about energy as a commodity. It, it can be sold, and the components delivering uh, into the, this market can be uh, sold around the, the, the globe. Um, also, economy, uh, or economy to scale is important. Then we have, we can see in the markets there's a strong focus on emerging markets to drive uh, even further sales. We can see the globalized value chain. We can see global centers and competence are coming up now. It used to be Denmark being clever on wind. It's not Den Denmark anymore. Actually, in, in many points, uh, Denmark is not leading uh, the, the R&D. When it comes to wind, you see very strong centers in China. You see strong centers coming up uh, other places, and um, especially America. We see for the test centers coming up around. There's NARIC in UK, there's a LOG in Denmark, but there's two big test centers coming up in, in USA. So actually these centers are going to, to, to distribute much more knowledge into to the market about what is actually working. And I think that's a, a very good development. Uh, that's the only way we can drive down the costs. Then we see different regional strengths, and we see again standardization and customer uh, powers. So I'm going to finalize this because I think that we are going to see a change in this market uh, very, very soon. And uh, think about uh, this room, we are standing here, we're just normal people, actually we are uh, consumers of energy, but basically we are just doing stuff like working, like going to school or going to work, uh, bringing our kids from school, uh, going to the grocery, get, get back with stuff. But whenever we do something, we actually consume energy. Think about this building. How well is it really designed to, uh, to understand our energy demand? It's really not designed to that. What we do today, most of our energy is spent in buildings and think places where we are. Think about a future where the buildings become much more smart. 
but they can actually tell you or they can tell the system whether there are people in the room or not in the room, in the hotel room or not in the rooms. So they can not waste energy where it's not necessary to burn out energy. That is the future of energy, meaning that the designers now we see in, in the building sector where we have designed for critical day is going to change into design for actual behavior of occupants. That's going to be you, me, everybody else. Where is the energy going to be spent and used? We are going to have much better systems where we can actually draw um, or demand energy much more flexible. One of the things about renewable energy is that it's really a very flexible resource. There's been a lot of criticism against uh, renewable energy sources, example given wind power, that they are not stable. It doesn't have to be that stable actually. Stability is okay, but the future is flexibility. That you can actually, you can actually pitch a turbine in and out of the wind, you can actually make a standstill, you can actually make it work harder, you can uh, use utilities much more than you have planned to if you want to, things like this. And this is where wind have a cutting edge uh, compared to other energy forms. So I think in the future you're going to see a brand new market uh, around renewable energy. A market which is driven by data, driven by consumers, driven by actual demand for energy and not uh, driven by um, designs where we actually design something for just uh, operating to critical day standards, but actually design for operating for actual behavior of consumers. And that is going to radically change the whole business. So we're not looking much into the wind turbine, but we are looking much into how can we actually fit the energy sources towards the end user. That was all for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Christiansen. Thank you very much, Christiansen, for his contribution. Now, uh, Mr. Famer Doan Engin he is the Cultural uh, Attaché and Trade Council in the, the uh, uh, Denmark uh, Council, uh, Consulate. He is the Investment and, and Financial Advisor to the Danish government. Before his current post, he worked at uh, Geneva Investment in, in Istanbul. He was a deputy general manager. And even before that, he was at the city group in the US investor department. The floor is yours. Uh, as Minipe pointed out, uh, in Turkey, we had a tremendous growth in the wind market. One of the main pillars of this growth was the financial strength around the wind deals, and EKF was one of the key players in this market. Uh, EKF is the export credit agency of Denmark. Uh, we are owned by the Danish state and guaranteed by the Danish state. This is extremely important because, first of all, a guarantee by the Danish state means a lot, even if you go beyond the borders of Denmark. But at the same time, there are very few countries in the world was left with a AAA credit, and Denmark, luckily, uh, is one of those countries. Uh, although we are owned and guaranteed by the Danish state, we operate on commercial terms. This is an interesting slide uh, because it shows the growth of EKF over the years. Uh, despite the, is it too close? Okay. Uh, despite the financial crisis, we were managed to grow uh, our balance sheet and also our customer base quite significantly. And Turkey is definitely a very key market for us. Uh, the current market exposure to the Turkish market is over 450 million euros. It's one of the biggest markets uh, for us. In fact, it's the fourth biggest market globally for EKF. But we would like to grow even more uh, because it's a very interesting market. Uh, the wind is definitely very key, uh, but we would like to grow in other areas as well. Uh, in terms of sector distribution, as I pointed out, wind is very critical for Denmark because Denmark is one of the leading countries when it comes to wind. Uh, you could pretty much source everything from Denmark. There is the whole ecosystem around the wind energy. But it's not just wind. Uh, cement is also quite important. I know this is a conference about wind, but just to provide the overall picture, 
as long as you buy something from Denmark, you can actually take advantage of the EKF. So this is, uh, again, an interesting slide. It actually shows the importance of WINT in our customer base. Uh, but at the same time, it also shows the diversity of our client base as well, because uh, you have, yes, energy companies, but you have you know, logistics companies, you know, food manufacturers, uh, all sorts of companies in our customer base. And we would like to even grow more, diversify more uh, when it comes to the supports that we provide to our clients. Uh, so this is pretty much a, a brief introduction about EKF. I just wanted to paint the backdrop uh, before I talk about the value creation uh, we could create. So the main idea here is that as long as you buy products in Denmark, uh, you, need financial, you may need financial support, especially on the wind part, because we all know that you know, the energy market is quite leveraged. Uh, most of the time in Turkey, you need to provide about 30% you know, equity, and the rest comes from the banks or some other you know, non-banking uh, financial institutions. So the majority of the financial structure is going to be on the loan side. Uh, most of the time, the way you finance that 70% is going to be the deal breaker. You, know, you have to be extremely careful, you know, extremely diligent about the way you structure it. So with EKF, uh, we can actually help you lower the interest rate, first of all, and also extend the duration. How are you going to do it? Uh, so there are two products that we typically leverage in Turkey. Uh, this is mainly for the trade financing. Uh, this might be another, uh, this might be one way of actually uh, triggering the way uh, to leverage EKF. Uh, so f in this scenario, uh, the supplier would be a Danish company. The buyer, this is the audience is Turkish, uh, let's say a Turkish company. Uh, but it doesn't have to be obviously a Turkish uh, company. It could be any company. As long as you are outside of Denmark, we can actually support you. Uh, so when you buy, say, wind turbines from Vestas or Siemens, uh, you don't want to pay everything cash, right? Uh, there's no point actually doing it cash or being actually providing everything up front. So you'd be actually talking to the bank to get the credit portion of things because always the equity needs to come from you and there are actually always CD rules as well. You, know, yeah, you need to be at least providing 15% of the equity, but in Turkey typically it's about 30%. Uh, for the bank, uh, the main question is risk. How are they going to price the risk? Because that's pretty much the job of the bank. They're going to take a look at your balance sheet uh, for wind projects. There are plenty of risks around the project as well. Uh, so there's a commercial risk. But there could be documentation risk as well. You have to be also careful about what you sign. Uh, and also there could be political risk. I mean, there are Turkish companies who invest outside of Turkey, like for instance in Pakistan for wind projects. Uh, and when you step outside of this, you know, more stable countries, when you go to Eastern Europe, I think I'm getting too close against the microphone, to Eastern Europe, to the North Africa, to the Middle East, or to the Caspian region, you have to be mindful about the political risk as well. So uh, all these risks matter for the bank. They need to actually have a healthy cushion uh, to cover in case something goes wrong. But just because you're buying Danish products, we love you. Uh, and we say that, you know, especially we talk to the banks and tell them that you know, if something goes wrong, Again, it could be a commercial thing, a political thing. By political, by the way, I'm not talking about dramatic things. I mean, there doesn't need to be a war. It could be basic things like, for instance, in pressure at the customs. It could be something to do with the local currency. So it doesn't have to be a dramatic thing. But as long as there's some political issue, we can also provide coverage for that. And there's also the documentation risk. So in this scenario, it's a win-win for everybody. It's great for the Danish company because they're going to be able to provide, uh, sell their products uh, to a Turkish company. It's good for the Turkish company because they can actually lower their financing costs. How? Because banks have almost no risk, right? If something goes wrong, who are you going to be paying? And still, they, need to, they can make a healthy return out of this investment. They are more than you know, willing to support you, more than willing to lower the interest rate, extend the term of the loan. Uh, because again, they'll be making a health return out of, out of this. In fact, there are banks, especially international banks, who got hit their quota in Turkey, 
but they want to work with us because they say if you actually can provide guarantees, we can extend even more loans to the Turkish market. So we actually provide a lot of stability to the market. Again, it a lot of flexibility as well. Uh, and it's also good for us. Why? Uh, because we are at the, hand, at the heart a governmental organization. Uh, we want the Danish economy to grow. Uh, it needs to actually support the Danish taxpayers. But since there's export from Denmark, it's going to actually benefit Denmark by creating employment and also taxes and so on. Uh, so everybody happy? Everybody's happy uh, in this you know, particular scenario. Uh, this is a very straightforward, obviously I'm not going to get into too much technicals, uh, but this is a very you know, simple scenario, uh, I would say. Uh, there are certain conditions, but you know, again, it's you know, quite straightforward. I think one critical thing here is that for the renewables, we can go up to 18 years. This is like substantial value just by itself. I mean, just if you can actually extend the term of the loan to 18 years, by itself is a huge advantage for you. And as I mentioned, you're going to be lowering the interest rate substantially as well. Why? Because Denmark has AAA credit rating. Our borrowing cost is quite low compared to other countries. And re in return, we could reflect that low borrowing cost uh, by creating value to our clients. Uh, for the wind, uh, again, like it's very similar to the structure that I explained early on, but in wind, typically there's an SPV, uh, a company that you established just for this project, and you need to be careful about the cash flow of the project as well. Uh, there's going to be additional due diligence. Typically, it may take you know, several months uh, because we have to be careful because we're talking about more substantial projects here. Um, you have to be careful about the risks of the investors as well. Like if the investor is doing a very aggressive expansion in northern Iraq, for instance, that is a risk. The banks need to, and also we need to be mindful about those things. But it's the, pretty much the same notion as uh, SPV here would be getting the loan uh, from the bank. The bank would be unloading the risk to EKF. Uh, and the investor would be injecting the equity and the exporter would be selling the goods to the SPV. So, but the notion is very similar. We facilitate uh, this uh, transaction or project by smoothening things, by making the environment more favorable to everyone involved in the project. Uh, the conditions are you know, somewhat similar here, uh, although the requirements might, might be a bit, uh, more, um, a bit more compared to yeah, the previous scenario. Sorry, I keep getting too close. Uh, but it's pretty much the same notion. Uh, but again, we can go up to 18 years if it's a renewable project. Uh, for instance, one example from Westas. Uh, actually, there's an even more recent example from Borisan, uh, who's going to be talking after me. Um, but you know, we've been in Turkey for a very long time, and we've done a lot of deals in Turkey. That, again, is a huge advantage if you work with EKF, because the banks know us, we know the banks, we know the local market, we know the players. Uh, so when you work with EKF, most of the time, uh, we're not going to be bothering you too much. Uh, the due diligence is going to be done with the banks, so you're not going to go through, you don't need to go through another layer of due diligence. Uh, and also, all the, you know, the paperwork between EKF and the banks are kind of straightforward because, as I mentioned, you know, everybody knows each other, uh, and it's already been done in Turkey many times. Another project, uh, this isn't wind, but it's energy, again. Uh, but just you know, to end this, it doesn't have to be about energy as long as you buy products from Denmark. Uh, just to link it maybe a little bit more to the topic of this discussion. Uh, so if you are, for instance, a wind manufacturer, uh, I'm sorry, a turbine manufacturer, and uh, like to source more from Denmark, you could be a German wind manufacturer selling products in Turkey. But if you source substantial uh, components from Denmark, we could provide you still coverage. Even though you're a German company, as long as you buy products from Denmark, we can provide the support in Turkey. So we are quite flexible as well. Um, this is more on the loan side of things. As I mentioned, this is quite important. But on the equity front, uh, front we can also support you. Uh, there is a new fund uh, established by uh, three pension funds uh, in Denmark. This is a closed down fund. Uh, it's about 100 million euros. Uh, these are the three pension funds, and obviously they have you know, huge um, assets. So hopefully they'll be even uh, 
additional funds uh, from Denmark. This is a closed end fund, as I mentioned. So they're, they're not going to pump more money into this fund, but you know, most likely we're going to have additional funds to this. Uh, in terms of geographical coverage, luckily we are in the mix. Uh, and also, you know, some of the countries that uh, typically Turkish construction companies work are also in the list. For instance, Pakistan, you could be actually doing a wind business in Pakistan, you can actually still get equity. Uh, this is the equity part, the 30% uh, part, as I mentioned. Uh, they always take minority stake. This is quite important. So if there are two uh, partners in the deal, they can go up to 49%. If there are more than one partners, uh, they still will take the minority stake. They'll never take the controlling stake in the deal. Uh, the deal size could be from 2 million euros to 50 million euros, which is about, like, let's say, you know, 20 million USD. It is quite substantial if you think about it. For instance, 20 million euro coming from this fund, say for the 50 percent of the project, or 49, and then the rest will be coming from a Turkish company. So in total, we're talking about 40 million equity. This is just the 30 percent of the deal. So in total, with this, you could actually talk about uh, projects that are over 100 million. Uh, we could obviously, you know, take less. We don't like to take less than 20 percent. Uh, but, you know, like easily you could actually finance uh, projects, say, 200, 300 million USD with equity from this. They like to actually have also a pre-agreed exit strategy. It's very similar to a private equity fund uh, in this uh, frame. They would like to get out, of, uh, get out of the investment in about five to seven years. Uh, they could sell it to you and they could sell it to the market, uh, but it needs to be a pre-agreed uh, strategy. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details too much. But it's important to understand that we can support you as long as you buy Danish products. That is the only condition. Sometimes I get questions uh, about, like, if I buy German turbines, would you still support us? No, we cannot support you. So you need to be buying Danish products, or there's going to be some Danish content in the deal. Uh, but we could support you on both on the equity side and also on the loan side. So this is a whole value for you. Uh, it's a huge market. Turkish market is huge. It's developing very rapidly, uh, but there is a need for financing at the same time, and we're trying to actually enable the growth of the Turkish market as much as we can. Uh, we definitely have the appetite uh, for the Turkish market. We like to grow more, although we are probably one of the biggest ECAs in the Turkish market. Uh, it was a uh, you know, very interesting market for us, and I can get into you know, more details in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thanks. We thank you very much, Mr. Farmerengen. Şimdi de e, Sayın Doktor e, Emre Orhan Bey e, tanıtmak istiyorum katılımcılarımızdan. E, kendisi 2004 yılında ODTÜ Makine Mühendisliği bölümünden lisans. He is graduated from Middle East Technical University, license degree, and his master's degree again in Middle East Technical University in the aviation and space engineering with his doctorate degree. He started his energy sector experience in Borusan and he worked in many hydroelectrical power plant projects. In Germany, he also leaded many project teams. In Borusan ENW, he has been working as energy engineering manager. The floor is yours. Thank you, Munich Bay. It's always difficult to be the last speaker. I will try to be enjoyable. I will take the subject from a different perspective. We are in the special session of Denmark in the procurement chain and we really wondered about the reasons how they created their value uh, and now we understand that uh, that's a value which was created long time ago with the support of the people and i would like to give you information about how we what we are doing in terms of wind power in terms of wind power we have two wind power plant restaurants and siemens companies are supporting us in Tekirdağ Balabanlı wind power plant 50 megawatt and in Bandırma 60 megawatt wind power 
planned and we have five more projects, ongoing projects. And this is the biggest wind package planned project. Bandar Mas extension is 27 megawatts in Izmir Fort. 30 megawatt extension and in Çanakkale Koru 50 megawatt in Bursa Harmanlık 50 megawatt extension and Izmir 30 megawatt. I would like to tell you about procurement changes that while evaluating the projects at the beginning we started with Fortress in Izmir 30 megawatt tender process started and following that we evaluated the size of the projects and we added five projects to the tender and the tenders of five projects were made all at once and we agreed with Bestas company. While talking about going to the root of the success, I really wondered how Denmark succeeded in doing so, and I made a small research about that. Is there anyone who have heard of, uh, heard about this project, Windcraft project? This project, a group of teachers in 2000, uh, in 1972, these teachers were named as radicals, by the way, and they were volunteers, and this project w was created by them. Westas used to be an agricultural missionary producer back then, and the motivation behind this as stated by Mr. Patterson, in the big economic crisis of that period, what we can do? How can we overcome this problem? Should we go with the nuclear power or are there any other potentials, energy potentials of Denmark? Following all of these evaluations, they created a group and they set up this turbine with the support of the volunteers. And any kind of contribution was accepted to this project and it was completed in three years. What matters the most here, in my opinion, okay, maybe I should talk about that later. In 1980s, we were talking about turbines with 75 kilowatts. But this turbine has a capacity of 900 kilowatt. I didn't have a chance to see it personally, but, I, but, I, but I, as I read, it still generates electricity. In Sweden, for example, a similar nuclear power plant, which was opened around the same time, was closed in 2005. Henrik Stistal. We all know from the nuclear power world, and he was really impressed by the trust that those people had that time, and they were working for the project on a voluntary basis, and they were trying to show the value of the wind. DTU RISO, X RISO, were founded by people who had this Twincraft project experience. This is a project with the support of the society. We can see how far it has come today. When we look at the effects of the voluntary efforts that day, the molding technology that we are using now is coming from those times and the turbine manufacturers are not sharing their information. It's one of the biggest challenges we face today, but in 1972, in the craft project, they shared all the information publicly. This is also very important. And the engineers who worked in the craft project developed RISO. 
and you know to sum up the position of Denmark is not resulting from luck it is community supported and it is on voluntary basis as a continuation of this we have a nice question what can we do as Borsan, we are still going on the projects actively. I don't want to go into too much of details of the project. We are working hand in hand with different institutes because the value created here is not only about the companies, but also the side branches should also be involved. And in this regard, there are many studies conducted in that regard. In Middle East Technical University, Ruzgem Institute was established and we are working uh, in cooperation with them. And within the framework of this institute, they have many laboratories, but most importantly, they are constructing no, they are going to construct large-scale multi-purpose wind tunnel. It is at the process of tender now, and next year this project is going to be complemented. This is not only going to serve for the wind industry, but also for other industries as well, and we will have a chance to test our works, and it will also serve for the construction sector. A similar tunnel is also being constructed in DTU in Denmark within the university. Therefore, it is going to be very useful for both sectors. Second of all, new European Wind Atlas study is out there. In the past, we didn't have a chance to be involved in these initiatives. And these are the elements that will constitute the value. The atlas was prepared towards the end of 90s and only the meteorological station data was used. And as a result of the atlas, in the projects developed according to the data of this atlas, there were some problems faced. And the aim now is to make the calculations by taking the uncertainties into consideration. While I'm talking about uncertainties, till 3% in non-complex areas and in complex areas, 10% deviations are going to be into consideration. Not only the wind power will be calculated, but also the deviations will be calculated. The modeling, the experiments, and the database, and we are working under the experiment branch. The consortium leader in Turkey is Tubitak, and this is a project of four years. On the left side, these fields are the test fields because of their characteristics, and we are here with our field in Mersin. In Mersin, this area has an altitude of 1,700 meters. It's a high altitude area. To sum up, in Denmark, this moment, this voluntary moment started in 1972, showed them how valuable the wind can be. And this conscious can be achieved only with the support of the public. And in Turkey, along with the project development, we need to support it uh, as a public. And as I mentioned earlier, Rusgem's wind tunnel and other new wind atlas projects were now being involved in those projects and we know that the wind in Turkey is valuable and we should show people that this is a sustainable energy source. This is all what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. If any questions, I would be more than happy to answer.
distinguished participants. If you have any questions, I would like to take the questions first. First, introduce yourself and then tell the name that you would like to ask your question to. Uh, my question will be to Mr. Pedersen. Uh, thank you so much for your interesting presentation. I have a little question that the point uh, 2050. You mentioned that uh, according to the target, uh, you're going to provide the energy 100% from renewables in 2050. Uh, at that point, is it uh, planned to use some energy storage methods or such to balance the energy demand in different times of day, or what kind of uh, precautions do you take? Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a really good one. So one of the things that uh, Mr. Kostensen actually touched upon is that um, in Denmark, but also this goes for the Nordic countries in general, energy production is considered not just a utility but a commodity. And in that lies um, part of the answer to your question, because, um, because renewable energy is uh, intermittent by nature, the Nordic countries also, all in the 1970s, kind of as a common reaction to uh, the oil crisis, uh, came up with the idea of linking uh, electricity grids together. And I don't think it was obvious at the time, but it has turned out to be incredibly efficient um, in terms of providing, uh, in terms of managing large amounts of renewable energy. So, for example, when Denmark has excess capacity um, of wind energy production, uh, Denmark will sell it to Norway, Sweden, and Germany. In some instances, the Norwegians actually use the the wind power that they receive, which is um, quite competitively priced, by the way. Um, they receive it, uh, they uh, use it for pumped storage, uh, water storage up their mountains. And at times where there's less wind and maybe less solar in, let's say, Sweden and Denmark, they can actually sell um, the power generated from this back to the Swedish and Danish grids. So this is a win-win. It actually supports the renewable industries across the entire region. One of the things that European policymakers discussed just a couple of weeks ago um, uh, in their EU 2030 package, which, which some of you may have followed, was actually um, increasing the amount of interconnectivity. And that's something that has really worked very well for the Nordic countries, specifically in, in uh, you know, being able to utilize a large degree of, of renewable energy. Um, so it, it's not really domestic storage, but uh, once you expand your, your energy system to also include neighboring countries and you um, perceive energy as a commodity, so something you can sell with your neighbors, uh, you, you actually can manage a, a, a pretty efficient degree of storage. Is there any other questions? So there's actually a research group at Aarhus University setting calculating um, within a complex, a complex networks theory how much additional capacity do we need to have in wind uh, turbines to cover stability and for, to cover, you know, crisis periods. So let me touch upon some different things first. You know, siting and um, knowing about what do we actually produce from the site is extremely important now. We've been uh, listening to different uh, methodological models. It has been uh, developed uh, very, very fast from very big, large meso models to very local models where you can actually follow the wind minute to minute and predict uh, the production. This is one, one very important thing because it means you can actually turn up and down production according to, to the wind source, first thing. Second thing, there's not just wind energy. There's also, like in Denmark, we have uh, the district heating and district heating have heat boilers, so when you have enough uh, energy from wind, you can actually activate heat boilers, you can heat up the water, and you can, uh, so to speak, distribute wind energy in your water tubes. That's another way of doing it. Third thing, there's, uh, as um, we, we heard about here, a lot of uh, interconnectivity between countries. That's 
taking off uh, the loads in the system very efficiently. So this research group, they came up with a prediction. Actually, you need two to five percent more wind energy capacity than you actually need to have the consumption covered. That's above the amount they think if you are in a 100% renewable energy system, not a 50%, but a 100% renewable energy system. So it's not really that much uh, you have to balance. Uh, and I was quite surprised it wasn't a bigger problem. But that counts for Denmark. So when you, when you take into the pan-European market, there are there's quite different uh, uh, problems in, in doing that. Right. Hey. Herhangi bir soru var mı başka arkadaşlar? Any other questions? Inaudible. Now the translators couldn't hear that. Excess energy in the Denmark, uh, he is asking, but maybe you have already uh, answered with the uh, pumping uh, upwards and uh, when it is needed, uh, you use it in the reverse way. Yes. Yes, that's that's certainly the case. But um, the I think that some part of the philosophy of energy storage. In, in Denmark has really been solved by creating a patchwork of different renewable energies that will have um, you know a high degree of production at different times so um, in that's not really an answer to your storage question but but in a way it circumvents or, or it uh, reduces the the need for uh, storage solutions which are te technologically difficult to come by yeah, right. Nasıl? Sorry, the gentleman is not using the microphone. Energy storage can be made with different formats. What is the breakdown of energy storage types you're using? I'm, I'm wondering about the percentages of energy storage types. They are pumping the seawater upwards and when needed it is just like the hydroelectric power plant. Are you using are you using heating method? Heating uh, processes. Are there kind of things, Mr. Erickson? So um, thank you for the question. It's really a difficult thing. When you transform one kind of energy into another kind of energy, you have a huge loss. Also, you have a very big uh, cost doing it, like you change from, uh, from electricity into hydrogen power. Uh, so, so doing this uh, or into um, um, yeah, hydro, hydro power, hydrogen power, doing that takes a lot of electricity and you have to transform and you have to carry that kind of energy uh, safely. Uh, so what we, we experiment in Denmark a little bit about this, we, we have some, uh, we dig some <laughs> rather big holes and we try to actually store uh, heat in, uh, in lower su surfaces of, of, uh, of the soil. Uh, whether it's going to be good or bad, we don't know, but we're trying to, to find if there's a capacity doing that. So storage is definitely an interesting thing. Uh, some, I know some also try to see if you can actually store in salt because salt is quite interesting. It's a, it's a, stable, um, it's a stable matter, and it's possible you can actually uh, store energy in there uh, as well. Batteries, of course, you can use batteries. Not really a good case in Denmark. I think the best case is, as has been said before, we have different combinations of technologies, and then we have a very good system about predicting the demand for energy from minute to minute due to a lots of different technologies but basically in every house in Denmark you have you have a you have a, a, a meter running which is uh, on the distant control you can actually see what is the single user going to consume now and you can see uh, f from 
minute to minute over uh, 24 hours a period, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you can actually predict what is going to, to be the demand uh, within the next few hours. And then you can actually generate according to that. That's what I mean by a flexible system. Renewable energy is extremely interesting because it's, it is flexible. It doesn't break down if you, if you uh, pitch out the, the, the turbine from the wind for a minute or two. It doesn't break down. It just operates on a li longer life cycle. So storage is not that big a fuss. I think uh, it's already been talked about, but, but selling off the energy quickly to other countries and transporting it, that's a much more efficient way of, of actually uh, getting rid of surplus energy production. I have one, uh, one other short comment, and it actually goes to sort of the uh, setting long-term goals for, you know, by policymakers, as, as I mentioned before. There's a really interesting example specifically relating to energy storage, and that is the state of California in, in the United States. Because I think uh, it was last year or maybe even in uh, 2012, the California state legislature mandated that uh, utilities in California have to make investments in energy storage technology, well knowing that the technology doesn't actually exist yet. But um, by the time of, I think it's 2022 or 2025, they have to have a certain uh, amount of their assets invested in energy storage technology. And this is, um, this is a really interesting example. They're very confident because they're California and because it's a technology heavy state that uh, the market will uh, react to this uh, funding that will become available and actually produce uh, solutions by that time. And I think that's a really good example of policymakers setting ambitious goals and, and um, basically creating a challenge for uh, you know, the technology sector to meet. Thank you, much. Thank you for your time. My name is Oscar Merkel. I'm coming from the Netherlands. I'm a project developer and planning a project in Turkey, northern of Istanbul. Um, I spoke with several people here and I want to focus on the question of the last speaker. Uh, the, of course, uh, the situation of the Danish uh, is uh, similar to the Dutch uh, case with a lot of demotics and uh, and uh, danced uh, grids, uh, smart grids, etc. But the Turkish situation is much different. And uh, I think the last speaker meant uh, uh, what, what to do about uh, this and the Turkish situation because we got a lot of uh, you know, regulatory, different prices, wholesale prices, uh, uh, prices of advisement uh, from government, and then uh, batteries or ground. Uh, um, uh, energy uh, put in the ground uh, would be a solution to solve these uh, temporary uh, problems. Uh, could you uh, comment on that? I know it's not your expertise, but uh, not focus on the Danish cases, but on the Turkish cases, because we are in Turkey. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Uh, it's a question for you. It could be, but I, uh, no. after Omar. In my opinion, in my opinion, one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest problems in Turkey is renewable energy is directly connected to the grid, and Turkey. Turkey also needs a smart grid uh, system. I think that's the best way to do it. And Turkey not only invests in uh, renewables, but Turkey also invests in gas and coal-fired plants. I, I don't have all the numbers with me, but the current share of the renewables in the Turkish grid, uh, I don't think it brings any risk or an urgent demand for storage. I think at the, at, at the moment it is not a pressing need as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Ömer. Well, I have, I have a closing remark uh, to this, but I have, we have another question. Let's first hear that question, and then we'll get back to this.
Hi. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Burak Katbolu from Res Anatolia. Uh, my question would be to Mr. Eric uh, Christiansen. Uh, you talked about uh, energy policies and uh, its position, uh, the renewable energy's position in the world market. Uh, my question is, there are like tools like uh, carbon emission permits and such other tools uh, which uh, try to drive uh, third world countries or other, uh, other countries out of Europe or uh, let's say United States. Uh, to switch to this uh, renewable energy world. Uh, do you think uh, uh, these uh, tools uh, will prevail or do you think that uh, business uh, as usual uh, approach will uh, take out and like drive us to some kind of doom in uh, uh, environmental sense? Well, just, just a short comment from me, and this is a private personal comment. Uh, uh, we have seen the CO2 uh, quotas as a, as a trade system that it actually is something you can lift off your company, but you can only do some kind of uh, certain emission uh, level. Uh, it is not really working very well. Uh, prices on CO2 quotas have gone dramatically down. It's not a, a pricing instrument where, where we see a lot of companies are tending towards being more energy efficient. I think, and that's a pity because uh, as yesterday, one of the main arguments really is if we can save energy, that is the cheapest energy we can actually harvest. And it's not difficult to save energy, it's, it's, quite, it's quite easy to do it. And the return on investment on exactly saving energy is very short. So whenever you have installed uh, new uh, systems into your house, then you get a, a, a good feedback uh, on your investment. So. What CO2 quarters does not do is to regulate uh, the incentives in the market for, for actually optimizing energy consumption. But what, what the market really does, if, if you want to, you can, you can have a very good business case in inventing, investing in, in, a, in energy efficiency, for example, giving houses. There's a lot of opportunities there, and you should just go use them. So there are alternate tools uh, uh, that, you, that can be used to uh, encourage uh, renewable energy in, uh, also in, at other countries outside Europe, you, you believe? I think um, regarding the renewable energy, I think uh, you should consider the total cost of life cycle, life cycle for a given plant. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that coal, coal is going to be more and more uh, expensive, gas is going to be more and more expensive. Wind is going to be cheaper and PV uh, is going to be cheaper. Hydrogen has its size. You cannot, uh, yeah, you can make artificial lakes, but it has its, its expensive, right? So, so you, can, you, you have to look at the total life cycle of the, the, the type of energy form. And there, renewable energy is going to be very competitive in price. But there is a weakness in the system. If you don't have a grid system that can actually take up this energy, or trade it, uh, then you're in, you're in trouble. Thank you for your answer. Buyurun. Bir soru daha var. Merhaba. Adım Sinan Değirmentaş. Hi, my name is Sinan Değirmentaş. My question, my question goes to Mr. Erickson. New generation uh, wind uh, components. Uh, if I mean, do we have any feasibility study on the next generation or new generation uh, components? Emre mentioned the wind tunnel. But I think investors are usually prudent and they wait for more mature, more established products to invest. I mean, we, and, and, and a lot of these things are done in secrecy and I really want to, I will be happy to know, I mean, do you, do you recommend us to wait until a component is used, tested and proven or would you, would you recommend us to be more adventurous and try new and uh, next generation components? 
That's difficult because yeah, who takes the risk? You. <laughs> <laughs> you also, you always have to, to take risk into consideration. So who is taking the risk? Um, I think uh, to very many components in the wind industry are very mature. Uh, when we look to the blades, there's a lot of scientific uh, research going into the blade structures, to the blade surface, to, uh, surface, to the blade uh, um, shape, uh, to improve the, the actually the wind surface on the blade. So blades have become extremely efficient, but can e even be improved by adding flaps or new types of, of shapes into into the blade. I know lots of things are going on in the wind turbines. Uh, sorry, the wind tunnel uh, project at Riesu, uh, DTU is actually going to uh, to improve on the, on the shape development. So if we look at blades, a very important part. It's a mature uh, component. We see new types of uh, composites, fibers used in. Uh, we see new uh, lightning protection systems added to the blades. I think that is that's not a problem. Go for for finding good. Uh, um, companies in the field that knows how to design a good blade. When it comes to the, the main drivetrain in, uh, in the turbine, uh, maybe we can agree that uh, there's been a lot of failures <laughs> in the market, uh, specifically on gearboxes. But gearboxes is not ha having that uh, big problem anymore. You see also new direct drive technologies from especially Siemens Wind Power or, or some of the German, German manufacturers, very interesting designs and they have uh, the, the benefit of having a lower weight on the, on the nacelle, which is very, very important. So uh, when it comes to um, sub-components like power stacks and all the, 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 the power control, and the, I think it's pretty mature. So I don't see, I see a lot of areas that has to be improved, but I don't as such see the main components in the, in the turbine as being uh, a green, green field industry anymore. Lots of you know there are many turbines out there and all of them have sensors and you have a lot of skater data you can ask mr emir about how they actually do surveillance on any turbine they have every turbine shows whether it's in good or bad condition that means we can track down the the, the mistakes very very fast so and learn about where do they f uh, fail these components also we have a lot of testing systems uh, around the world where we actually do a highly accelerated lifetime test, hall test, and we do functional tests. So we learn a lot about the components all the time. I think that, is, uh, that has changed the industry. So no, I wouldn't uh, be, uh, I wouldn't feel a, a large risk, but then again, you can always ask for warranties. And of course you have to pay a little additional for that, but uh, that's a good idea, yes. Maybe, uh, Ömer Bey, çok küçük. Yeni bir türbin üretmekten bahsediyorsunuz galiba. Are you talking about producing a new turbine, new type of turbine? Are you are you want you want to you want to build your own turbine for Turkey? Can someone give a microphone to this gentleman? I cannot hear him. I'm sorry. I I honestly could not hear him. We want to produce our own turbine, and we want to know the, you know, the level cost of it. You know, I need more data sh sheets. Shall shall we wait for the next generation turbines or what? All right, here is my answer. I suggest you to follow the trends. You know. Uh, like now, now I mean the the towers are rising uh, and the blades are getting bigger, but then in a sense, you know, it's not a greenfield industry anymore. Uh, there are improvements, and it's a continuous improvement. Of course, there's always progress about the structures. Like the blades are the the blade diameters are as wide as 150, 60 meters. I can only imagine uh, this. Airborne uh, technologies, they, they are like a kite, a smaller one, but com compared to onshore and offshore, they are uh, much more affordable. If they, they can prove themselves, the airborne uh, windmills 
can be the next uh, thing, but I don't think it will come any so anytime soon. And then there are high altitude uh, turbines, like uh, 500 meters, very high altitudes. We're talking, and they want they want to benefit from the high altitude uh, wind flows, but the, but they are not commercialized yet. They are just tested at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. Because for commercial purposes, you, you need uh, to test them and certify them. And turbine manufacturers don't necessarily take added risk. They have an established platform. They work on improving their diameters and shapes and things. I think this trend will continue. I thought the question was coming from a slightly more sort of general perspective. So, so let, me, let me just answer from that perspective. Um, you were asking about adventurism. And I think in general, what we're seeing at the moment is the, the price of investing in, in, fo in new fossil power generation has actually become the adventurous thing to do. Um, because if there's one thing that's more or less constant at the moment, it's that the price of renewable energy is, is being pushed down and down and down. So um, a lot in, in Europe, a lot of uh, coal power plants are going to be phased out in the next 10 to 20 years but they're unlikely to be um, replaced by new ones simply because the cost of meeting the higher um, environmental regulations and the cost of attracting capital has become much more complex and, and frankly extremely difficult. It's, it's easier to uh, invest in renewable energy projects um, because the capital is there and because we know that the projects that will be fielded uh, one year from now, five years from now, and ten years from now will actually have a, a, an even better return on investment than what we have today. So you, you kind of have a, um, a reverse order of adventurism in, uh, in, in those two examples now. Okay. Buyurun. Son soru olsun. One last question. Açık mı? Şimdi hep büyük türbinlerden bahs. I mean, thank you for talking about the tur turbines and blades and high altitude and long diameters. But why not go for the smaller, like uh, 10 10 megawatts for for uh, you know. If, a uh, slower wind. Why, why don't we incentivize, you know, expanding on? I mean, uh, are we so eager on, you know, high me megawatt, you know, for high altitude, for for the big? Do we have to go for the big to to earn more? Why not focus on efficiency? But in Turkey, the minister is not working on it, and the private industry is not really advertising them. Anyone wants to, wants to take on this question? Okay, let, let me let, let me take this question. Well, Turkey Turkey has a soaring energy demand. The projections are uh, suggesting a big gap. That's why uh, everyone is talking about the bigger sizes. But talking about efficiency, I mean, can we can we go for a 10 uh, key, key, kilowatt design? Well, why not? But I mean that 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 typically works for a household or maybe maybe for a small factory, but that won't. And I have no objections at all. But then, I believe uh, most of us in Turkey. I mean, our primary purpose is to meet the energy demand of the nation, not of a household. Uh, allow me to close the session by tackling with a number of the issues and the addressed the topics. O potansiyel ki sürdürülebilir, ulaşılabilir. I mean, there's a, everyone agrees that there's a great potential in this market. But if you want to benefit uh, this from this potential, that our plan needs to be sustainable and affordable. And I believe the Turkish uh, renewables market is a sustainable market. I know there are there is criticism about the prices going down, but but I mean compared to Europe, the prices are at a at a favorable level, and the current market outlook, in my opinion, is is sustainable. 
there are great opportunities as long as you you have the right instruments and you act on the right time and i i i can promise very uh, lucrative businesses that that is my personal statement for the turkish case now and in the near future renewable energy and wind power projects offer great opportunities again this is my personal statement and uh, let's make best use of the opportunity that is my humble conclusion uh, I, I want to thank uh, all panelists uh, for their vivid presentations I want also thank to TWEC uh, the, 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 to, to the World uh, Wind Energy Council and the organizers of this conference. To those all uh, helped us make this happen. I want to thank to Jesper, Pat, uh, to Eric, from, to Femer Don Engin, and Dr. Ömer. Thank you very much. It was vivid, informative, and knowledgeable. I want to also thank to our, to our audience for your patience and for staying with us in this late afternoon. Uh, I hope uh, we all benefited from this. And, and before I let you go, uh, we have certificates of attendance. Or th I'm sorry, thank you certificates to the panelists. Thank you certificates.